Okay, I'd like to welcome you to the last of the formal sessions today. I'm Laurie Cohen, I'm a professor of organizational behavior in the business school. And the panel this afternoon includes David Kalkoon, Athene Donald, Felicity Miller, and John Turley. And they're going to be following on really neatly from Andy's talk, debating and discussing a good news story from science. So I think that we'll be picking up on a lot of the themes and issues and tensions that we talked about in the previous session. I know that you all have a lot to say, and so do the panelists, so we'll get, get straight on with it. You'll have seen their bios. Um, everybody's going to be talking for about five minutes. Like we did before, we'll allow for the odd question for clarification as we go through the presentations and the short talks. And then we'll open up the floor to discussion and debate after that. And I would like to finish at 5.15 because that's when we said we were going to finish. Okay. All right. So thank you to the panelists. And we'll start with David's presentation. Oh, this is a a spoof paper, as you might gather, extension of human life and sixty-nine years. Uh, if anyone who reads the literature will recognize the archaic typography as being a uh, typical of science magazine. Um, of course, you now have to say what part you took in the paper, the section, which is as extensively lighted as any other. Um, so the first author who did the paper wrote, given that we have only extended the lifespan of fruit flies by 3%, I originally felt that extrapolation of these results to humans should be expressed with less confidence. <laughs> because the Telesenko overruled my objections and the paper was accepted anyway, I had a distinguished journal and I recognized my, my uh, <laughs> caution was excessive. Second author, included to this paper, are, if anything, understated. But after an art wrestling match with Dr. Lysenko, which I lost, I agreed to commute the word immortality to my own in 69 days. And so on. The trouble is, I mean, this is a pretty biting indictment of the sort of thing that is not so infrequent in science magazine. But this was not in the science magazine. This was in the New York Times in 2006, sometime before there's no new about this. This is the opinion that a lot of intelligent newspaper readers have of science, and this simply won't do. <coughs> um, I'm going to use a lot of slides. Um, but I will touch on all metrics, because that someone mentioned it earlier. Uh, of, of all the metric systems that have been proposed, this is quite the daftest. It really is iniquitous. Uh, the old metrics top 100 for 2013, the second paper in that was one called primary prevention of cardiovascular disease with a Mediterranean diet. Anything with diet in is A, usually wrong, and B, gets yes, more publicity. And the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most highly rated medical journals, treated it. Our new post focuses on a trial that shows Mediterranean diet results in less cardiovascular events than the low diet. Not even grammatical, of course, you should be sure of it on that. If you actually read the paper, it said there was no detectable effect on myocardial infarction, no effect on death from all cardiovascular causes, or no effect on death from any cause. The only difference <laughs> that there was was the number of people who had strokes, and that showed uh, a p-value of 0.04, which gives you a, a chance of at least one in three of being wrong. <laughs> that, that's not just to be not as widely known as it should be. Your, your chance of making a false discovery rate if you were wrong, P, whatever, would be really very high. Um, okay. Leave the slides, I think. Um, that's a, that was a journal press release. But the author ones uh, are, are the, the university ones are usually just as bad. I, I did try to warn UCL's PR department not to make a big fuss about a recent paper that said you must eat seven fruits and vegetables a day, not five, on the grounds that the paper was lousy and was in any case uh, 
probably not true because it's all correlational. But they didn't take any notice and they got all over the newspapers and everyone was saying, is this an April Fool joke? <laughs> and, and they were right actually because the, the evidence simply is not there. Um, but the problem always comes back to the authors. The problem is actually not the press, it's not the journalists, it's, it's not even the university PR department, it's the authors, they okay everything. They, and they will okay things that are desperately misleading because they think it will get them publicity. And they want publicity because FC says you must have impact. FC is corrupting science in a serious way, actually, by this sort of thing. Um, what can we do about it? Well, certainly the biggest problem is publish or perish and the tyranny of impact factors, something I wrote about it. Nature in 2003. David Campbell actually read its nature, is quite sensible about it, but uh, it seems to me that, that there are no problems in science that we couldn't solve by the destruction of the nature publishing group Elsevier. <laughs> <laughs> Wonks in Hefsey who insist on you having impact. Whatever that means, what, 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 what Hefsey says it means varies from time to time five different definitions. Um, this provides a direct official incentive to dishonesty, and people react by being dishonest, not only in major ways, but in, in small ways. The sheer volume of papers is enormous, and probably 90% are not worth the paper they're written on. They're all published in peer-reviewed journals. You know, the, the Journal of Homeopathy is a peer PubMed. It's just a joke for peer review in, 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 in journals like that. It, 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 it does act to harm. Uh, in, in my own field, which is at the sort of fairly hard end of biology, uh, the referee's reports can, can be quite useful. But that's not generally true. I think that um, what we need to do is have everything published openly on the web free to read and with a comment section. eLife is a brilliant journal which was recently started edited by Randy Shepman who is very good about the glamour journals. Um, but it has no comments after it. What we need is post-publication peer review. And of course you have to have a little moderation to keep out the, the trolls who nation kills you, whatever you write about. It happens to be in the BMJ anyway. Um, but Sites like PubPeer have shown really good, acute, post-publication peer review. And that's, that's, I think, is the way that it has to go. Um, there's been lots of hoaxes that have shown just how bad the problem is. Uh, there was a French computer scientist, Cyril Labbe, used a random number generator to, to generate articles in computer science, which put together trendy phrases in random order. He had 150 of them accepted. Uh, and by knowing how Google Scholar works, he got to be the 21st most cited author in the field. And th this is completely dishonest, but it works. It's gaming, and it's exactly what is being encouraged by our elders, but not betters. Well, probably not my elders, but your elders. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, science got a spoof paper accepted by 157 open access journals. Unfortunately, they only sent it to open access journal, which science, of course, has a, a vested interest in, in um, destroying. I, I do, I, it would be much better if they'd sent it to all journals. So, it, it would certainly help if universities didn't subscribe to things like old metrics, but you don't have it, because they're just money-making propositions. They're kids with computers who skim off superficial views of things. Uh, and sell it back to the university for a profit. Uh, if you look on our, our UCL's internal website, I can see my old metric score for, uh, for, every, for everything. Because it comes as part of Macmillan's symplectic package. We're just being ripped off by the businesses uh, and, and uh, our work distorted. The only thing is, old metric score for me is a paper on on acupuncture. It's actually had more views than anything else on my blog, 30, 
1,000 views the last time I looked, but it's hardly my best bit of work. <laughs> um, so, there's other things that can be done. Smaller groups, more of them. Spread the, spread the money more thinly, because you never know where something is going to come up. Open access, I've talked about. And a proper understanding of statistics. People don't understand the flimsiness of the evidence provided by people. You could probably remove a third half of all published discoveries if you just prescribed uh, a significance level which um, gave you a reasonably low risk of making a false discovery. And that means 0 0.001 or a three sigma rule, not a two sigma rule. Um, I've got some slides about that, but I won't show them now. Um, now the trouble is, We've been rumbled by the public. In polls, scientists are still relatively well trusted um, compared with many other jobs, but they won't stay that way if we go on like this. We've got to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for clarification? Okay, moving on to the theme. Okay, so we've heard a lot of negatives, and I, I mean, this session is going to be called a good news story, and I would like to put some positives, because I actually think, as scientists, we do need to communicate what we do, um, and we need to do it honestly, and I don't, I don't think it is inevitable that we all hype our stories, or uh, manipulate things, or that the journalists are out to, to do the same. So I'd like to put across the view that as an individual scientist, we can try our best, but we're not always very good at that. Not because we're dishonest, but because we're not well informed or trained as to what's required. Um, so any young scientist, either with a publication coming up in a glamour publication or not, doesn't really matter, may feel they have a story they want to put out as a press release. And I think when you set out, it's very easy to be incredibly naive about this. Um, so I think we need better media training for young scientists, and that includes how to write a press release. So a colleague of mine in Cambridge recently had a paper out, which was something, I, it's not my field, it was something to do with cats and allergies, and it got massively picked up by the press. So the press team had written a perfectly responsible, I assume, um, press release, and she was being interviewed all over the place, that our press office did nothing thereafter to help her. So she was getting all these questions, she was getting all these interviews, and my own view is that um, our young scientists need to know how to handle that kind of thing. And she said that she felt um, utterly wiped out by it, that she got some confidence as she went through and did more and more interviews. But that's not really a very helpful position to be put in. Insofar as these were radio interviews, I think largely, she had some control. It wasn't that a, a journalist was reinterpreting her words or anything. She was in control. But nevertheless, it is very easy under pressure to slip up. Um, there is, of course, lots of, uh, lots of control. We haven't heard much about um, sub-editors and headlines. Um, I feel quite strongly that that is often where things go wrong, um, not necessarily in the least bit deliberately, um, but they do tend to um, focus on the thing they, will, they think will catch the reader's eye. Um, I recently, uh, not particularly a sad story per se, but I recently got into some kind of argument with someone in Nature about a piece they wrote about the number of women elected to the Royal Society this year, which was actually a fairly respectable number. It wasn't brilliant, but it was fairly respectable. But the headline was written, uh, Royal Society Trails Behind the National Academy of Sciences. Small print, if you read the article, pointed out all the things the Royal Society was doing and all the uh, the fact that the pool is larger in the States and all that kind of thing. But the headline was, I felt, deeply misleading. Um, and I think in that case, the journalist came back and said it, that they had written the headline themselves. It wasn't a self thing. But nevertheless, I think that quite often things go out of control through the headline. Um, my own experience as a, a young and very naive scientist was not around... Um, 
a results paper at all. It was a press release that went out about a large grant we'd got. Um, and I had no idea, this was in the late 90s, I had no idea what could go wrong. And it, we, we got a large grant about colloids. And if you don't know what a colloid is, don't worry. Um, uh, but you wouldn't expect anyone to know what a colloid is. It's fairly technical. And so I tried to draw an analogy. And I drew an analogy about what happens when you make custard or white sauce and all the particles clump together if you don't make it in the right way. And this, this is because there's a lot of surface area and the surfaces make um, particles stick together. And of course, it was then picked up by all the programs who wanted to interview me about my research on white custard. And <coughs> It was, it was a most horrendous experience. Um, you know, I got sort of on air being asked, um, come on, admit it, you're just doing domestic science. <laughs> um, and I felt that my uh, press office had badly let me down by allowing this to go through without warning me that this was not a good thing to do. Um, but also I had, at the time, had absolutely no media training. Um, and I wouldn't talk to the press again for about 15 years because of that. I, was, I felt very annoyed and I think that is exactly what can go wrong. It was a perfectly well-intentioned attempt to explain what was going on. Um, but you have to learn and you have to be helped and I don't think we get enough support in universities from not on constructing the basic idea but on warning of where things can go wrong, of helping people progress um, and you constantly need to update your media training. I've now had various different um, media training workshops specific to what I'm doing. They've largely been about launching reports and things, again, rather than about science. But you need to be challenged as to what questions are likely to cause you trouble and how to prepare. Now, if, if there is a good news story in here, one of the things I feel is we shouldn't just be writing news stories. I think we should be doing much more about informing the public engaging the public, if you like, with what we're doing in a more generic way, in an ongoing way. Um, and I personally believe uh, that blogging is a wonderful way of doing this because you are totally in control and you can put out not news stories, but factual stories about uh, work in context. Um, I have a vested interest in saying this, I think the Guardian Science blogs are brilliant because you have control, and I know there's at least one other blogger from Guardian Science blogs in the room and maybe more. Um, you have control, you can write about what you want, and it, you may want to make it topical, but you don't have to. You can write about anything that takes your fancy and inform the public. I think we have a duty to get the kind of science we do out there wherever we can. And it may be through uh, blogs, it may be appearing on radio, and just sneaking science in. And the pressure to get scientists on question time, which almost is saying how much he can't watch question time. But yeah, it would be good if scientists appeared on it and said their say. But I know that not even Paul Nurse wants to do it, so <laughs> there are challenges. But I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to get our science out there, not just science news, but our science out there wherever we can and have confidence in doing it and support it. Steve Jones was magnificent on question. Yes, I didn't get asked again. <laughs> There you go. Married the old husband asked again. This should get hard. Thank you. Any questions along the way? Okay, thanks. Um, so when I was preparing what I might say today, I thought, what on earth can I say that Andy Williams won't already have said? And indeed, Andy Williams said everything I can possibly say. So um, I'm going to be perhaps a bit repetitive, but uh, uh, the positive way of putting that is I'm going to reinforce some of what Andy said with um, some ex an example of, uh, from my own research. So um, this was a, an analysis I did of the BBC's science coverage as part of um, uh, some it was work commissioned by the BBC Trust. Each year they undertake to examine some aspect of the impartiality of their coverage and they choose a different topic each year. They've done Palestine, they've done business news um, and in that year, I think it was 2010, um, they chose to look at science and as part of the review they commissioned a content analysis which uh, I undertook and the review itself was written by 
the aforementioned uh, Steve Jones, um, at, uh, Professor of Genetics at UCL. Um, so there are these two separate bits of work, so I'm just talking about the content analysis. So we looked at the actual output um, from the BBC, and I'm going to say a few words about what we found in their news coverage. And um, it confirms everything uh, Andy was mentioning, uh, his works based on newspapers. We find the same uh, in the BBC's um, output on television, radio and online. So um, the one, the main thing I want to um, mention is, of course, the uh, issue of the press release dependency. So we found that about um, three quarters of the broadcast news items about new research findings, so that's quite a specific you know, sort of sample, uh, but three quarters of those items appear to be sourced from press releases. And, um, this was the finding that most affects the BBC executives. So they got sent a draft of our analysis um, before it was published, and um, they came back with, um, uh, you know, sort of contesting that finding, and then put together, rather hurriedly, admittedly, a list of all the original stories um, they'd covered in that time period. And um, and yet I worked out if if um, if those were all their original stories and it might be they forgot some, but if it was as a proportion of their overall output uh, in that time period, actually it was pretty much as we had found. It was uh, three quarters uh, were derived from press releases. Um, so this tells us one thing about the sort of professional ideal of journalism, that they want to be um, sourcing original stories and they see that as part of the, you know, the true grit of being a journalist is, is you, you've got a nose for a story and you go out there and you ferret out um, the, the stories you get in scoops. Um, and that might, I think we need to be a little bit careful of just sort of uncritically accepting that nostalgic notion of what the journalist does. And I think um, since our um, analysis, the BBC have perhaps put a little bit more effort into finding original science stories. And actually, I find these even more problematic because to get those original stories, the journalist has to get close to the scientists and get into those labs. And it's almost like the problems with an embedded war reporter, that it's then almost impossible for the um, science journalist to say anything critical about that story if they've got sort of um, um, sole um, access into that laboratory. Um, so for me, the problem is not so much that stories are sourced from the press releases, but that so little is then done with those press releases. Now, for the BBC, of course, it has to do something because press releases tend to be written documents and um, uh, what the BBC needs to put out is, is TV and radio packages. Um, but they tend to, as Andy suggested, follow the narratives, the framing, the... the, the um, um, way of presenting the um, story that um, the press release material does. And um, in particular, they rely mostly on interviewees who are named or are associated with the institutions that put out the press release. So they're not looking for additional sources beyond what the press releases provide. So we found that almost three quarters of BBC broadcast news items um, associated with press releases included no inter interviewees um, at all or else relied entirely on contributors um, associated with the press release institution. And only 11% of items, so only about one in 10, included comment from scientists whose institutions had not been mentioned in the, uh, had not put out a press release. So they're not looking beyond the press releases for contributors. And then that relates to another issue um, that I think came up in the discussion after Andy's um, uh, talk about balance. So balance is something that um, scientists worry about. They, they feel that the BBC and other news outlets overuse balance when reporting science, that they use false balance, that it um, is inappropriate to use balance in, in covering science stories. In fact, what we found, that uh, we found quite the opposite, that most science reporting has no balance at all. Um, only about a quarter of BBC um, broadcast news items and just over a third of their online news 
items included a contributor who expressed any form of critical comment about the research being presented. And in most cases that was quite a cautionary comment, so it might be something along the lines of, well, more research needs to be done, or um, and there might not be funding to develop this, you know, some sort of caution like that, rather than fundamental questioning of the, of the assumptions behind the research. So there's very little interrogation of the actual conception of um, the research and, and the assumptions on what it's based. And where there are critical comments, this rarely comes from scientists. So we also so we found that the use of balance when it did appear was perfunctory and quite mechanical. The, the, the journalists would go to the usual suspects. So if it's a story about animal research, they go to the British Union for the abolition of um, vivisection. If it's a story about climate change and they want balance, they go to a Nigel Lawson's outfit, for instance. So, so they go to the usual suspects for um, oppositional comments that come from outside science. We hardly ever see um, this sort of questioning of science coming from um, scientists who are not connected with the research. Indeed, we found that in just 6% of the um, items reporting on, on research. Um, so the, the problem is then that um, science journalism in this culture of journalism fails to probe and where balance is, is deployed, it's done so in that mechanical manner. Um, and um, yet yeah, I also think that we need a little bit of caution here in thinking about, um, so this arises from the, 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 the PR dependency of uh, science journalism. That is not an entirely new thing. Um, if we think back to some of the earliest science journalism, um, for instance, when um, Sir Arthur Eddington announced the results of his eclipse um, expedition, which confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity, they had a very stage-managed presentation of those results. It was reported by the Times. The Times science journalist happened to also be a professional scientist. That was his main job, and he wrote for the, uh, the Times on the side. So there was already a very close relationship with between scientists and journalists, and um, there were already stage-managed uh, events like that. What we have now, though, is I think a far more widespread institutionalization of that PR culture. And what's more, that takes place in a context of uh, a commercial corporatized media and equally a corporatized science. And I think that's where the, the real problem lies. Thanks, Lucy. invitation as a, as a prompt to reflect on back to about 1980 when I kind of got into writing about science and policy. I'm not going to try a full perspective. I'm, I don't even know how you would do that, but it would be an enormous research project. So this is nothing but a few impressions. And they're under the general intensely controversial heading of some things have changed a lot, but some things have stayed the same. Um, an enormous amount has changed over those, those last <coughs> three, three and a half decades. The, the internet arrived while I was having a writing career. So that, that changed a fantastic amount of things. It affects how writers practice as well as where they publish, who reads them and how. Um, when I used to write little science stories for a medical newspaper, I would read scientific papers, sometimes press releases, not often in those days, in hard copy. If I wanted to find a new story, a news story, I would go to a library and browse new, new copies of journals. Remember, remember those institutions? You contacted researchers by phone or even by letter sometimes. Um, 
Now I sit at home, of course, I can get any, any paper I want on my desktop in seconds, um, email researchers with follow-up questions, and they usually answer properly and generously. So that whole infrastructure is utterly transformative. There are some downsides. My old employment, well, that's 20 years ago, in, in print journalism, what the Americans is what the Americans now rather dispiritingly refer to as legacy media. Um, but there is writing online also, which is a, a wonderful free-for-all with hardly any gatekeepers. Um, that has enormous complicated consequences, which I don't begin to understand, and I doubt if anyone here does, because they're unfolding before us in real time, and it's, it's real hard to research that and keep, keep abreast of what the effects are. So I'm not going to dwell on those, I just note in passing that is occurring. The ecosystem is shifting almost daily. Um, and there's also been the rise of this new thing called the micro-record. I started as a science writer and then I discovered I was actually a science communicator, which is a more <laughs> professional, academic, informed thing. Um, and that has its good and bad points. It came with a growth, also an academic study of science communication and how it works or doesn't work. Um, and, if so, and indeed, more sociology of science journalism. So when I delved into study of journalism in the 80s, because I was interested in what I was doing, what the academics thought about it, the discourse was about competitor colleagues on, speci on, specialist, on specialist beats, with whom science journalists are just one example. There are many similarities with other kinds of specialists. Um, it was about gatekeeping. It was about how newsroom cultures were created and sustained and agenda setting. Now we'd be more likely to talk in terms of expressions of, of various ways of communicating risk and particularly framing of media stories, which is an old thing because much more common term now in science communication. And framing is a determinant of how a story is told and of its reception. So all of those changes. On the other hand, I do also see a good deal of continuity. I think, certainly in the way that I work and the way I think about what I do when I'm writing, the business of explaining complicated, sometimes technical, as we've said today, complex stuff and ideas as clearly and simply and courteously as you can, I think it still feels the same to me. I'm talking here about the translation function of science writing rather than the muckraking. Um, it seems to me the kinds of things I try to encourage when I taught people science writing are as applicable to science and policy writing now as ever they were. And of course, other things that don't change, the tensions between scientists and writers, especially in policy-related domains, seem very familiar to anyone who's looked at this over many years. They probably have more places to grow now. I don't think they're fundamentally different. Um, I don't disagree with anything that Adini just said, but I, I, I can imagine a scientist reflecting on these things in 1980 would have, could have come up with rather similar anecdotes about how their career had unfolded in, in relation to being burned by science journalists, learning how to do it building relations of trust with individuals and get learning to do it better. There's finally one thing which has altered, I think, in my own assessment of all this. Um, and I contrast there with myself with, with scientists. Perhaps scientists, I think, and other well-disposed folk would, would like to see relations between science, media, and policy get better. That's what we're here to try and uh, work on. I suppose that's a small, late footnote to a pro progressive enlightenment outlook. If we identify the problem, and we analyze it, and we try really hard, we can make things better than they are now in some rational, stepwise process. Um, maybe, I'm not sure how strongly I believe that anymore. Um, I used to, certainly. In some ways, I think things have got discernibly worse. The cloud of accusation and denunciation that constantly swirls around climate change, science and policy, which is the great issue of our times for me, um, is the most glaring, obvious example. That might just be because it's so important. It's kind of the, it's the diametric opposite of the, the old quip about why are academic disputes are so terrible. Well, it's because the stakes are so low. Well, actually, <laughs> in global environmental change, they're terrible because the stakes are so high. Our life as we did because it's state. Um, so I think if, th if things are going to be improved, the change will be incremental, the increments are quite small and slow. Um, and 
because the media ecosystem is changing so fast, they'll be pretty hard to track as well. So I'll, I'll confirm the impression I'm probably giving of being rather long in the tooth and a bit jaded by saying that um, as with global change, global environmental change itself, I'm not particularly optimistic about any improvement actually being achieved in my lifetime. Um, but as with global change, and as uh, our first keynote speaker finished earlier, I'm not, I'm not yet so pessimistic, but I don't think we ought to keep trying. Thank you. Questions for John before we open the discussion up. Okay, like we did before, if there's a specific person who you want to direct your question to, then say that. And also, if you can make sure that you have got the microphone when you speak so that it can be picked up by the video, that would be great. And we'll just try to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can, whilst also giving the panelists plenty of time to answer. Okay, so we'll start over here then. Hi, so my name is Dave Farmer, a physics student. Um, my, my question was primarily for, for Athena here, and you mentioned you you'd love to see media training as part of, part of science training. Uh, I, I agree with that very really strongly. I say communication training generally, writing a blog post is totally different to writing a science article. I think that's really lacking from what science course. But I was wondering, when, when exactly in this sort of job of science education have you seen this? Is this something you just try to catch and then really search before they make a big mistake, or, or do you better early on in almost the other graduate? I think some of the stuff you can do at undergraduate level, but I think certainly one-on-one -on -one media training just isn't feasible. I think you can have some classes in writing different styles, which I think would be wonderful. It was certainly nothing I was ever offered. I think what is interesting, certainly in my own university, it is clear that there is media training, I think for PhD students, but certainly for postdocs that's available, but not later, which is I think, I mean, it may be that in due course that will be fine, but at the moment, the people who are putting out the press releases aren't the ones who've had the media training. Um, things like the Royal Society for the University Research Fellows provide media training. There is, and, and the research councils do quite a lot. But a lot of that is to early career researchers, and I think there is a gap in kind of mid-career, which may well be when you find you need to do it. I think one of the problems, as I, I hinted at, is Global, sort of generic media training is only, you know, it'll only do you so much good. It may tell you how to look at the camera and possibly how not to answer any questions you don't want. But you actually need to think through for each story what it is that people, um, are trying to put across. Very specifically, what hostile questions you may get, you know, are there ethical issues you need to be able to address. It's quite difficult to do that and I'm sure no university has the resources to do it as thoroughly as maybe ideally they should. Writing a blog is much more fun than writing science because you can express yourself <laughs> in a, an informal way. In fact, writing is actually influenced the way I write science. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, well, let's see now in a science paper. People oh, don't okay. like it because it's meant to be terribly stilted and formal. But, but a lot of students can't write either sort of paper. <laughs> 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 I think I support the scientific articles generally. I find them particularly hard to read. Yes. Um, and I wonder if there could be a change in that. Could, it could be, made, could be trained to make science articles absolutely um, easier to read because I mean, I, I, uh, there was a, a quote I saw on, on Twitter a little while ago where someone had said that, <coughs> that job is making it very difficult for lay people to access academic research. Implied that jargon makes it very difficult for academic researchers to access <laughs> academic research. In my opinion, the amount of times you go slightly outside your field and you can have almost no idea what's going on. And I think it's a real issue with, with journals, and yet yeah, it seems to be the case that you get the right buzzwords in the title and you get the right notes in your, your conclusions and your introduction about, yes, I've cited all the relevant papers that were published in science, then that seems almost be more important than have you written coherent piece that some of the following read with you. Um, I don't know, that's possibly that's a really cynical <laughs> view from 
Thank you very much, sir. I don't think so. It was wonderful. Peter Lawrence had something to say about the hype up your work. Uh, uh, to go here, it's now screen back. Slice the five minute lunch, much as possible for the to make bad compress the results. Most top journals have little space. The typical major letter now has a density. <laughs> Simplify your conclusions and complexify the material more difficult. It is a sort of uh, this, this tendency to complexify things. Actually, social scientists are far worse than physical scientists. Some of the jargon is just other other people's jargon is always really exciting. Okay, there's a question there. Hi, my name is Fiona. I'm doing a PhD in chemistry here at Nottingham. Um, my question is um, for authenticity, actually. It's something I noticed you saying you're talking about um, scientists and, in the BBC and not having balance. And you say, um, I was just wondering if it, if it is good to get other scientists contradicting work in the media. If you've got a media full of scientists contradicting each other, are you just going to end up with people <coughs> who just don't trust scientists at all? Um, yes, that, that is the, the danger. Um, alternatively, perhaps we would develop a more sort of mature understanding of the nature of science and would see that it doesn't offer absolute statements about the world, but rather is um, something that's cautious and tentative. Um, and that at the essence of that process is um, the process of, of questioning. And that's currently sort of invisible in much news reporting until we get to a controversial episode where the science is contested. Climate change is the big example, but you know, any sort of public policy issue that draws on scientific uh, evidence, the science gets contested. And we just don't have the, the language or the habits um, in which to enter into that arena. So it becomes very polarized and it's this camp and that camp. Um, and, it's, and we're expecting um, a simple answer about which, which side has got the truth and, and this is often not that answer. So I think we've got to trust in public intelligence, dare I say, um, and suggest that if those debates were out there in the public that, um, that, that they'd be taken for what they are. Um, and indeed, I mean, maybe that stuff in an example the other day was an example of that. It's, you know, well, yes. it got worked through and talked about and, and you know, we sort of got through that. Do you, you know the story? I mean, briefly, someone had a paper quite not very long ago in the BMJ and snatting has got side effects, but that was an uncontrolled study. There was no no control in this, it was obviously not very reliable now, but, and, but after that, somebody did it properly, actually, this author, this contained Ben, ben Goldeck, so I believe it, uh, showing that the placebo and the control had just the same uh, rate of side effects, or almost the same, not quite, uh, and then, uh, Ben points out that's reliant on data that comes from companies which may not be complete. But it, but it looked much better for statins. But the professor of uh, uh, the head of the clinical trial duties in Oxford Rory College got very angry about this uh, paper which contained the reference to the uncontrolled study and demanded that the whole paper be retracted. Now, if, if you had retracted a paper because it contained reference to uncontrolled observational work, the entire literature on nutrition and health would vanish overnight. <laughs> Uh, and the, the, situ the, 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 the question of whether you should take <coughs> or no electricity, you should take statins, is, is not a simple one, whatever we call it. And I think actually the AMA were quite right, but the, the BBC didn't put it that way. They kept on saying to Fiona Godley, editor of the AMA, gosh, you got an egg on your face that time, didn't you? I think that was wrong. Okay, the woman next to Danielle. Hi, Danielle. It doesn't have harm to have, sorry, it doesn't have harm to have that egg. I'm really loud, so just reverberate. I apologize. So I'm Sylvia McLean from the University of Oxford. One thing I'm finding a bit difficult about this discussion is floor of tea things. 
uh, one of which is the whole kind of negative. Um, and it never sounds like scientists are going out of their way to do bad PR and to mislead people who get high impact papers. Uh, maybe my science just isn't that sexy, but I kind of feel like I try to be as honest as I can. And the other thing it sort of neglects is the fact that much science ends up being wrong. And it ends up being wrong because we have new data, not because there's something nasty inherent in the system, or maybe somebody's actually made a mistake and forgot to divide by two in their paper. And that happens as well, because we are just humans. So I think this, maybe I'm wrong, but I think this debate's I think, actually neglecting a bit of this. Are so you talking about the whole <laughs> channel? So who would like to start? <coughs> Well, I, I would certainly agree. I think this is coming out as very negative, and I think that's a great shame. That's what I was trying to say, because I think it is important to communicate, and there is lots of exciting stuff to communicate, and some of it should be about how science is done. And, and so to your second point, I think if you can have a dialogue or a discussion, which won't be a new story, but discussing how science is done, and it's quite interesting to take it in a historical context, because then it, it sort of removes the personalities in the present, but you can see how science has evolved based on the best idea at the time and how it can then be falsified. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of truth in what you say. We need to do a better job, to come back to Felicity's point, about explaining the nature of science, because I think it's too easy. If, you, if you've only done science at school, you may think that, you know, there is a right answer. And if you do the experiment the right way, you will get the right answer, and that's the end of the story. Because unfortunately, that's how school starts comes across. Yeah, most scientists have zero interest in the public. My own scientists, they don't care about clock on processes in discrete states in continuous time. But a little bit, I can write about that, and write about other things which I think might be more interesting. But um, the trouble is, the stuff which is interesting tends to be the worst stuff. It's always pomp psychology or phony diet studies, the, the things that are most easily corrupted, very frequently wrong. They're the ones that appeal to journalists, they're the ones that get on the news. Most scientists, most science never appears on the news, would be of zero interest to the, the listener, which is why it doesn't appear on the news, I suppose. Did you have something you want to add? Just to pick up on the point about being negative, we, we also mustn't be too negative about science journalists. I mean, what they do is actually um, very impressive given the, the pressures they work under that Andy um, outlined earlier. So um, we can understand how they sometimes make shortcuts and, that, and they're also having to produce what their editors want to see. And I think they do a remarkable job under those pressures. Yes, I don't think it's the fault of the journalists, it's the fault of the authors and the universities. But this issue of evidence as itself a contested thing and constantly being changed and, and so on is something that goes back to the former panel discussion, in fact, um, how, how contested or uncontested is, is the whole question of evidence. Yeah, the question. Oh, Daniel, I think Danielle something. Oh, Danielle, are you? Yes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the mic's going to actually. Um, so, we're facing this trend of journalism becoming shallower, okay? more and more a copy and paste of PR written uh, texts. I'm assuming uh, something I heard seems to suggest that this is kind of an inevitable process and not necessarily even a negative one compared to the past. Um, assuming some of you think this is not the case, then um, would there be a solution to it? I would think of at least two that have been suggested. One was by Bengal Dega repeatedly said, well, the future of science journalism is having scientists writing about them with the help of a professional communicator. Um, the other way to go would be to encourage some form of investigative uh, science journalism, which presumably employing, I guess, PhDs, experts of a particular field, is able to dig into the stories in the way some would think journalism should work. I'm wondering if this or any other solution would be advisable in your opinion. Are you asking anyone in particular or the panel right. in general? John, do you want to start? Let, let, me, let me try and be positive there because I was going to be very positive. <laughs> <laughs> I think this feature of science writing is, is very exciting um, because the internet, okay, forget these papers, just think about the affordances of online spaces. You have 
a legion of bloggers who have the time to read the papers and do all the checks that uh, the journalists apparently no longer are able to do because of their workflow. You have uh, places to publish where nothing has to be a prescribed length. It can be longer if it needs to be, or it can be short. I, I'm an anachronism. I rather like the 15th century technology of books. But you no longer have to write a book. There are lots of places where you can publish um, what Americans call long form, which I think just means long articles explaining things until you get to the end of the explanation. And there's infinite scope for developing this. Lots of caveats about how you monetize it, how the, the organization stays alive, how the people who write the stuff make a living, but you know, solutions will be tried and thrown and discarded and eventually found. And it transforms the information landscape. So I was I absolutely think Andy's research is of the highest quality, but my personal view as an internet consumer is you know, nobody who wants to be seriously informed about anything would read a newspaper anymore. Why would you? They're just such trivial, shoddy goods. But there's other stuff out there, if you go look, and some of it is fantastically good, and I'm, I'm constantly overwhelmed by more really, really high quality things to read than I could possibly cope with in a way that I didn't experience 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Guardian's called onto this very well. A lot of the Guardian science blog are written by scientists, which has two advantages. They tend to be better quality and uh, more thorough, and, and uh, for the Paper that most scientists work for nothing. I was also going to mention the Guardian, but not so much for, for its um, free blogs that it, that it imports um, and brands, but um, I think that they took a decision a few years ago about you know, how can they position themselves in this changing science communication landscape and they um, decided to do less of that routine journalism that, that, that um, draws on the journalism and um, to, to try and do more longer form um, analytical pieces. Whether that actually shows up in their output or not, I think it's questionable, but um, that was at least it. Um, and likewise, we should remember that science journalism happens in other places as well. So the, some of the main journals, of course, have news ends to them. So nature and science um, produce um, some excellent science journalism. And um, they employ people who are essentially journalists as well as their sort of behind the scenes uh, editors of the, the specialist output. And, um, I think that it's um, suggested that um, perhaps the, the, the people to be doing that sort of more probing analysis are people with PhDs in the field. I think that's absolutely not right. Um, I think the, the best journalists are um, the people who are able to ask questions and think of who to ask questions of. And uh, having a PhD in that specialism is more likely to be a hindrance than a help. Ooh, that's an interesting <laughs> comment. Yes. Some people might want to reply to that. But first, there's a question in the back. Thanks. Um, it's pretty much the whole panel, but actually, David mentioned one word there, which was very important, and I don't want to get lost, which was pulp and peer. So the whole future of not only science communication, but actually peer review is getting completely revolutionized by the web. We now have post-publication peer review. I think up until a few years ago, the idea was that you publish your paper and that's the end of scientific debate. I really hope over the next few years, data post-publication peer review sites like PubPair, it's going to be seen as the start of debate. And that's going to be exceptionally important in terms of how that then couples with science communication. Just that last week, um, PubPair released a wonderful browser plugin. That means that when you go to a website like Nature or Science and you look for a particular paper, if you've got this plugin, you see the public peer comments room, you see the comments from peers on this particular paper, who are now discussing it in the open when it's been published. That, I hope, will be revolutionary. Yes, it should, it should come straight after the paper in the journal, of course, probably will soon. Yeah. Up here, being a separate site, it's a bit clumsy, but it does well. I think the one caution I would say to that, Phil, <coughs> is that there are sites where you can put your comments anonymously, and it's rather like trolling, and I'm sure you know about this. And I, I think, I mean, I think this is something that, that there does need, and David referred to moderation. I'm not sure this is moderation, but I just think we need to have transparency. Yeah, or at least there's a debate. 
So at least there's a debate. This is the same bit of water rights. But, but the trouble is that it can then turn into um, sort of a, just a sort of attack on the individual rather than the debate about the science. So the moderation can be, I think it's actually yes. essential to allow anonymous things. The, there was a paper by, uh, from Imperial, which was discussed extensively on public here, and some of the anonymous uh, comments were wonderful, actually. They were really incisive, they little calculations, they, they worked stuff out. And it, would be, you know, it doesn't matter who wrote it, you just read it. But some good. of them come out from an text. Oh, some, some do, but that's, yeah. that's where the tricky business of moderation yeah. comes in. You never get anyone young contributing to anything, you have to put their name down. You may get have to say who you are to the moderator. Mm. Well, that's okay. That's exactly it. Yeah. 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 Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'm from the UCLC. Uh, I've got a question about early careers researchers, um, which is related to the impact agenda that we've had a lot about today. Mainly in negative terms, in terms of this disrupting the natural practices of science. And I wonder if there's another way of looking at it. Um, I went to a talk recently for early careers researchers. I do quite a lot of um, support and work for early careers researchers where we were told um, we needed to publish six first book papers a year in order to have a chance of um, getting on a professional event, which seems absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> 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 you must be out of their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Find a better place to work. Any, any <laughs> University that tells you something like that is a place to avoid. <laughs> 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 um, I agree with you, but nevertheless, these are the messages that we receive a lot. And, you know, and about slicing and dicing papers, you know, it's a way to ensure that you get um, a job. And you know, that's obviously unsustainable, and as we just discussed, it drives down the quality of the science. But early career researchers, perhaps people who are more likely to want to engage in the media, to want to engage in blogging, that kind of thing. And one of the effects of the impact agenda is that it does start to take notice of those kinds of activities for early career researchers. Is it possible that you know, the whole impact agenda might actually reduce the pressure on early career researchers by saying you don't have to publish all these ridiculous papers? There are other types of activities which are valuable as well. That's the whole plan. I think we will actually, because this is the sort of, it, it's still your research and matters far more than anything yeah. else for promotion, whatever people say. Mm -hmm. I think it is perfectly possible um, that it is taken into account as part of the bigger picture, but it's hard to see research not being the primary driver. But any organisation that gives you a metric like that, it's just shocking. It's field specific, it, you know, it depends on so many things. I think in my life you could never dream of publishing more than one proper experimental paper. Mm -hmm. Takes too long. In, math in mathematics, in pure mathematics, it's probably about one paper every four weeks. So. <laughs> I think Andrew won. It was ten, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. It, that, that sort of remark is really deeply worrying. Mm -hmm. There are people who work in universities who think like that, they should fire the money and stuff like that. The one it's good thing, but the good thing about well, the way we do it, you can have that dialogue because I think yeah. you know, there's lots of information. It's not about science per se, but about life in science out there. It's really helpful because if you put that out there, enough people come back and say, no, 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 that's not what I've been told. And at least you get some reality. If there's any consolation, there was an occasion, it was a little while ago now, when I was on a single committee for the Royal Society with a terrible invidious job of selecting four people from about 60 to be elected. And one of the candidates had 450 publications. And I said that means they haven't read most of them. They can get elected. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm so glad it wasn't uh, their age index is something, because that's another kind of comment that should be banned. <laughs> Uh, again. Can I ask a question about other uh, forms of journalism? I know you are talking about science journalism in terms of entirely, but maybe some members of the panel can give a sort of tentative answer. I wonder how much of that what you've been describing is typical for journalism in general. So if you think about other fields like politics, economics, financial situation, etc., uh, is, is there a similar trend? 
uh, that you would say is going on there, or is science journalism uh, just very specific? Maybe yeah. Andy should come in on this as well. I, 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 thought, I think the whole amount of newspapers is there across, especially in politics, is still in the lead. Um, and certainly, going back on the, the characteristics of specialist correspondence, and that you can locate them on a spectrum from cheerleaders to muckrakers, but most specialist correspondents tended to be cheerleaders. And when we, the, the, the far end example would be you know, the property correspondent you know, is there to basically you know, recycle PR from, from estate agents. Um, the defence correspondent needs credential, press credentials from the Ministry of Defence, so they're unlikely to be terribly critical of defence policy. The motoring correspondent, on the whole, tends to favour the idea of private transport, people like motorised vehicles. Um, politics and health and social welfare are much more complicated, but you know, the specialist correspondents as a type, I think the science journalists are more like them than other sort of general reporters. So journalism is a complicated thing, but it has its it's, it's common analysis across, across the specialties. There are quite a lot of fact-checking things now. Tim Harvey on, on the radio. And uh, what is it? There's uh, C4 check, fact-check. Lots of people checking numbers, which I'm uh, putting it in. Duncan Smith Rice. Too late, but it was, I think it's very really, really cross. Better than nothing. And on the, on the, other, on the other side of the culture, I mean, science is one part of the culture in the whole area of critical commentary, cultural correspondence, criticism is, is being hollowed out because people will do it for free. Basically, you go to the theatre, you write a new view, you post it on your blog, the local city newspaper, put it on their website, why, why pay a theatre critic? You know, that's, that's all just going away. There's no, there are no jobs in that sphere of media anymore. So if you wanted to come back to the idea of investigative journalism, would that be, uh, would the role model be in political journalism? Well, um, or something to, to look at if you wanted to have that? I don't think necessary political journalism, I mean political journalism isn't very investigative either, although it's, it, it occurs within very tight limits dictated by party politics, um, you know, there's much political critique that just isn't voiced in the mainstream um, news. So, um, but, but um, you know, the, the big serious news outlets do have traditions of investigative journalism, um, and much of those efforts have been looking at political issues, uh, as well as social or economic issues, and, and so, yeah, I mean, there is a tradition there to build on. I, I, I think, I, I think uh, again, the internet and crowdfunding is the answer. There are sites where, I forget the, some of the names, but where you can post an article you wish to write and I'll invite people to subscribe in advance and help you pay for the research to do it. There's an obviously an enormous scope of that kind of thing at hyper local level, community level, national level, international. Um, we, should, we should fund the journalism that we want and we can do it directly. Choose the writers we want to write to. The, the BMJ does now have, um, I forget what the title is, but it's something like, you know, editor for investigative journalism or something like that. So they, they, they see, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, they, they see investigative journalism as something that they are prepared to pay for. Brian Deer, though, I think, almost starved to death over these <coughs> investigations. It took so long. They were so obstructed by the world. Of the one of the people, it must be said, in the private universities. That, that, um, you know, I, I think he had a really hard time. He did a fantastic job in the end, but it took him 10 years. Yeah, you probably need a grant, a big grant to a very, very small appetite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to sustain the risk of the Okay, another question? Um, Stuart Parkinson. I, I wanted to ask about what the panel thinks uh, of the difference between reporting on science that's about understanding the world reporting about science that is around developing new technologies because particularly with the background where so much science is orientated towards the, um, coming up with commercialisable technologies and there being a much more important role to ask awkward questions around the technologies and whether there has been um, 
enough independent science looking into possible side effects and also because there are that's where the political values and, and all the so, sort of debate um, around use and misuse of science comes in. So kind of back to this morning's initial presentation. Any comments? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> It's really hard to talk about either, either science that's separate from technology or even technology as a different technique. There's an aspect of particularly of legacy media, but even the net, where technology is just shiny things which you, you, you will buy. There's also technology as in how do we decarbonize the economy, where we have a society where oddly every, every energy source you can think of has people who are strongly against it, which is a peculiar position of society to be in. That all plays out in journalistic and other other contexts. So I think, yeah, but they, they are different. I mean, the the people who are driven by very highly organised PR put the, the hadron collider on the front page are not thinking about the sorts of issues which are a good technology writer might be thinking about. But there aren't that many specialists in technology. And there aren't many technology correspondents. It tends to be driven by personal interest in particular writers with a flair who carve out a niche for, for writing and thinking about technology. I think it's not something that newspapers really recognize very easily as a, as a topic even. You know, the, the, infrastructure, the, the future infrastructure correspondent <laughs> that one would love to be doesn't, as far as I know, isn't a paid a media position. Nobody was thinking of DVD players when they invented lasers, were they? And, I mean, heaven knows what thing is really needed in technology is a colour screen you can read in sunlight. <laughs> 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 it's possibly bad. God knows what sort of technology, what sort of basic development will be needed to design such a thing. But I think it's also a case of sort of intersecting different areas because um, the, the longitude prize that's just been launched this week, one of the areas is around improving life for, for patients with dementia. And there's quite a large ethical element to that. And you, you can't just discuss, I mean, tagging dementia pa patients so that if they go AWOL, they can be tracked. You know, that, that technology exists, but the question is, is that an appropriate thing to do? And I think you cannot take the technology in isolation there. Andy, did you have a question? It was more a comment. Am I allowed? Is that right? So make a little comment. Yeah. Uh, about, about, first of all, whether science journalism is unique or whether the same problems have been talked about occur on other things. I agree with you, John, but there is some evidence in the literature that would suggest that because of the particularly technical nature of the knowledge that needs to be communicated, going to, as they call it, is more of a problem slightly in, in, in science news. Um, but the, the, the one I really wanted to talk about was, was where the thing going on was for critical investigating news. Um, and you said we looked at politics. I, I don't think we should be looking to different feats of the mainstream news media. We should be looking to different funding models for funding investigating news. And there are really interesting things happening with organizations like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, ProPublica in the US. is a foundation funded independent critical uh, engines of investigative journalism. This isn't really happening much in the mainstream news media anymore. And where it is happening, it's happening in places like Guardian, where they're cushioned from the assistance of the market, they, 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 they have the Scott Trust, which enables, they have the Scott Trust, which enables that kind of um, news to, 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 to happen. I'd really like to see a version of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism for science. Um, and I think that it would be good for, for society and for the long term interests of science as well to be to be scrutinized in that way. Yeah, well that's the kind of thing I was trying to allude to as well. But I, I think crucial will be a plurality of funding sources. I, mean, I, I, I bow to no one in my admiration for the Wellcome Trust. They've just funded a splendid new science magazine with a weekly long form feature called Mosaic. The features are fantastic, um, but in the end it's a corporate product. So although there are a few writers who are free to say whatever they wish, there will be some subjects where 
and when they're discussed internally in the Wellcome Trust, I'm sure will fall off the list. I mean, how could it not be so? So more things like that funded by other people would, would also be a good thing. Or funded by Wellcome, but through a foundation which puts firewalls around this. Uh, I mean, it would be interesting to put a proposal to Wellcome for a Bureau for Investigative <laughs> Journalism for Insights. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll help you write it. <laughs> and, uh, I, th I think I spent some of my time doing that. You know, some paper hits the headlines and I go away and read it properly. And, 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 and half the time it turns out to be rubbish when I say so. And it's quite fun. But, but I couldn't do it if I had a full-time job. See that, you know, to expect uh, young academics to do this as well as the 10 other jobs they need to be doing is just to be in the sky. They were really working 60, 70 hours a week. Over and above reporting scientific news or new scientific knowledge, do you think that there is any valuable role that other forms of sort of cultural media play in the dissemination of the scientific process? I'm thinking about programs like Jim Alkalili's The Life Scientific, Desert Island Dis, or programs like that. Um, the Moral Maze is another one. Well, I, I would say uh, the start of the week and um, Melvin Bright, because I think they're, they're programs that a lot of people listen to week on week on week, and then you can get some science in there. Mm. Um, and I think that is an extremely effective way of, I mean, you should be able to talk about the sun. The scientific method, but you know how science is done, mm. um, and get it across in in, in appropriate words. I, I was saying to someone earlier today that I thought, why can't we have scientists discussing what's in the newspapers? You know, mm. on the Andrew Mel show. It seems to me there are lots of places where scientists could do a really good job of talking about science in a generic kind of way and helping to you know let the public know what it is we get up to, what it is the taxpayers' money goes on. I wish there was more of that. They have what, tomorrow's papers on BBC yes. and about half past I'm always going bar to start tweeting like that. <laughs> <laughs> because the journalists sort of strand that and they are going to get this Well, I mean, it's good if they get a science story on it to talk Yeah. But, um, yeah, they should have a few more science. And, and I think, I mean, it's, 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 there's a slight <laughs> problem with the fact that the BBC doesn't have many people there who care enough about science mm. to want to make this happen, and I think that is a challenge. Our analysis of the BBC's output included non-news um, outputs, and then we found science in a huge range of programmes and quite a large quantity of programmes on some channels, not on others, of course. BBC Three has virtually zero science, but um, you can find it on other channels. Um, one thing we also found, though, was that so scientists got to speak on, on such programs, there was almost no presence of other sorts of academics who have expertise in science. So, sociologists of science, philosophers of science, ethicists, historians of science, we get all these history of science programs on TV, you never see a historian of science. And Melvin Bragg's um, program is a great exception there, because he does get the historians in to talk about his science. Simon does Simon I'm exaggerating slightly, but, um, and maybe that's actually those were more recent, so maybe actually they listened to that vision of our analysis. But in, in our, I think the figure was something like 3% of contributors were um, science studies types. Um, so it's not only a problem about... Um, what is the relative number of science? Um, Scientists achieve these other categories. Well, I'm not sure that's relevant. It's what is the topic, and if the topic is the history of science, why do we hear scientists telling that um, when the people who know the the subtleties of that history and, and um, the nuances are, are probably the history? Well, Simon Schaefer does tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah Simon Schaefer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, well, history of science. I'm not, I, I'm not sure I want too many social scientists or philosophers. <laughs> 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 well, I think this is the last question. It's not even a question, it's a very, very brief comment. The whole focus has been on the BBC and traditional media. So Minute Physics, a YouTube channel, has 2 million subscribers. Vsauce, a similar science channel, has 6 million subscribers. There's a huge, you know, and the vast majority of 18 to 24 year olds are not watching traditional television. Any television they watch is on the laptop.
how, how many videos has that number bar got about the sum of positive interviews in my time? Twelve, it's yeah. impressive. Two million, well over two million, yeah. And that's a really esoteric topic as well. Has it got more than your rock song? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I think we'll wrap it up. It's just past 5.15. I want to thank the panel so much for a really interesting hour and 15 minutes and to you all for your attention and your engagement and all of your interesting comments.